Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today, we're going to be discussing Hogwarts' lovable gamekeeper, Hagrid. What do we really know about Rubius Hagrid? The towering half-giant seemed to be a simple, content groundskeeper, but when we look back over the years, Hagrid's life was filled with tragedy and all sorts of challenges. Starting at the very beginning, today we're going to unpack Hagrid's life, and taking a look at the highs, lows, and everything in between. But before we get too deep into the in-universe aspects of Hagrid's life, I thought I'd first enlighten you with a few little-known factoids about the inspiration behind Hagrid's character. The list of Harry Potter characters inspired by real people is lengthy, including Severus Snape, Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, and even Gilderoy Lockhart, to name a few. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that, just like these other characters, Hagrid too was based on a real person, a biker to be precise. In Harry Potter Page to Screen, The Complete Filmmaking Journey, according to Robbie Coltrane, the character was modeled on a real biker. Coltrane said that JK Rowling told him that Hagrid was based on a Hells Angel she knew in the West Country. He was just huge and terrifying, Coltrane recalled Rowling telling him, and then he would sit down and talk about his garden and how his petunias had been very bad that year. Rowling also supplied some interesting information pertaining to Hagrid's name, revealing that, just like many other characters in the story, his name was very carefully chosen. Hagrid is a big drinker, who's regularly seen by Harry to indulge in visits to the pub and even getting inebriated. His name alludes to his personality trait because Rubius is related to the word ruddy, which means reddish and is apparent on someone who drinks a lot. Parents like with anyone's origin story, Hagrid's life would never have come to be had it not been for his parents. Hagrid's parentage was a pretty poorly kept secret. To most, it seemed obvious that he was born from a mixed relationship between a giantess and a wizard. Still, Hagrid tried to keep the details a secret at times, although he never quite fooled anyone. His mother was known as Frid Walfa. Since we don't have the clearest records, we can't be sure when she was born, but Fred Wolfer must have been at least a few decades old when she gave birth to Hagrid in 1928. Like any other giant, Fred Wolfer was well over 20 feet tall and a force to be reckoned with. With a natural resistance to most spells and curses, it would have taken over half a dozen wizards to defeat Hagrid's mother in a fight. For that reason, the wizarding world feared giants like Fred Wolfer most of all, which makes her marriage to Hagrid's father all the stranger. At some point, prior to Hagrid's birth in 1928, Fred Wolfer first met Hagrid's dad. The historical records never revealed his full name, so we only know him as Mr. Hagrid. Although giantesses and men had been known to wed each other, it wasn't a very common practice. As you could guess, wizards and witches frowned upon mixed marriages, and even the giants, who valued size and power above all else, looked down on their peers who married weak human wizards. But Fred Wolfer and Mr. Hagrid actually gave their relationship an honest attempt, and they were happy for a while. Mother's Abandonment In December of 1928, Fred Wolfer and Mr. Hagrid welcomed their son, Rubius, into the world. Almost instantly, Fred Wolfer's demeanor changed. In giant culture, they prided themselves on having the largest, strongest babies, and after a quick glance at the infant, Rubius, Fred Wolfer realized that she had failed. As a half-giant, Rubius was a fraction of the size of other giant babies, and by the time Hagrid was three years old, it became glaringly apparent that Hagrid would never grow to the same size as other giants, which caused Fred Wolfer's loyalty to falter. Ashamed by her child's small stature, Fred Wolfer decided to run away and fled back to her giant colony, before Hogwarts. In the years that followed, young Rubius Hagrid lived a simple life with his father, the pair lived in the west country of England, near the Forest of Dean, which is the cause for Hagrid's distinctive accent. Hagrid doesn't say much about his old man, but he seemed to be an honest, kind wizard. Before Hagrid was even old enough to attend primary school, he had already grown six feet tall. Often, he would throw his father over his shoulders and haul him around the house and yard. Although Hagrid and his father had a strong relationship, Hagrid's social life suffered outside of the home. As a half-giant, other parents would often warn their children about playing with him, 
It wasn't until Hagrid received his acceptance letter to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry that the young boy thought he could finally find a close-knit group of friends, his first wand. But before embarking on his journey to Hogwarts, young Hagrid, just like so many other students before him, made the trek to Diagon Alley, specifically Ollivander's, where he would receive his first wand. It seems strange that for as long as we've known Hagrid, he's held an umbrella in place of a wand, and while Hagrid's original wand is inside of this umbrella, it was once a fully functioning magical item in its own right. Hagrid's first wand, free umbrella, was a 16 inch oak wand, rather bendy with an unknown core material. Those with oak wands usually have an affinity with the magic of the natural world. A bendy wand signifies a high level of adaptability in his personality, and the length of his wand is representative of his large stature and enormous personality. For these reasons, Hagrid's wand seemed just about perfect for him, but the wand purchasing process wasn't exactly straightforward, because it wasn't until after purchasing the wand that Hagrid's magical powers surfaced. You see, magical powers aren't revealed in a magical child until they are provoked out of them, sometimes remaining dormant for a considerable amount of time. In Hagrid's case, he was a late bloomer in that his powers didn't truly manifest until after he had received his Hogwarts letter and purchased his first wand from Ollivander's. This can be partially attributed to the fact that Hagrid simply never had an incident in his childhood where his emotions were heightened. Without the proper stimulus, his powers simply didn't manifest. Fortunately, however, his powers did start to appear just before embarking on his journey at Hogwarts. In 1940, Hagrid began his first semester at Hogwarts School. Following his arrival at the school, Hagrid made his way to the sorting ceremony, which in his case has proven to be a topic of contention amongst fans. Though there has been much speculation over the years and a considerable number of theories, it turns out that, rather unsurprisingly, Hagrid was a part of Gryffindor. Given Hagrid's bravery, kindness, and nobility, this probably isn't much of a shock. And while his house is not revealed in the books, it is revealed in an article published on Wizarding World. That makes this little factoid canon. The prospect of attending Hogwarts was quite bittersweet for Hagrid. While attending Hogwarts would provide the opportunity to meet other magical children and expand his magical horizons, it also meant that he would have to leave behind his beloved father. Hagrid also quickly realized that, in some aspects, Hogwarts wasn't all too different from the real world. At school, he continued to suffer, as his fellow students ridiculed and bullied him. If he were anyone else, he'd use his natural brawn to turn the tide against his bullies, but Hagrid's low self-esteem and non-violent disposition made him a natural target. This caused Hagrid to instead search for companionship through magical beasts and creatures, showcasing very early on his affinity for the natural world and the creatures within it. However, this hobby did land Hagrid in trouble on more than a few occasions. As a student, Hagrid raised werewolf cubs under his bed, trod off into the Forbidden Forest to wrestle trolls, and even acquired an acromantula that would heavily impact Hagrid's future. By his third year at school, Hagrid had grown to nearly 11 feet in height, but unfortunately, he continued to struggle socially. To make matters worse, Hagrid's father, Mr. Hagrid, suddenly passed. Eventually, Tom Riddle, who was only a few years older than Hagrid at the time, decided to frame Hagrid for a recent murder at the school. Riddle was actually the one responsible for the crime, but he managed to convince the Ministry of Magic that one of Hagrid's dangerous pets, an acromantula named Aragog, was the culprit. In the aftermath, Hagrid was expelled from Hogwarts and forbidden by the Ministry from using a wand ever again. However, thanks to Albus Dumbledore's quick intervention, Hagrid was saved from going back into the real world as an orphan. Dumbledore managed to land Hagrid a role, studying how to become a groundskeeper. This gesture of kindness might have been enough to keep Hagrid from a life of crime. With his father figure gone, the young half-giant had nowhere to turn, and the fate of giants in the wizarding world was usually a bloody painful one. Official Gamekeeper So, as the years passed, Hagrid grew and grew. Under Dumbledore's watchful eye, Rubius lived a peaceful life. With each passing semester, the faculty entrusted the young half-giant with more responsibilities, until, eventually, 
He was promoted to head groundskeeper sometime before 1967, succeeding the previous groundskeeper, Og. Hagrid's role went by many titles, gamekeeper, groundskeeper, and keeper of keys. On any given day, Hagrid could be seen securing the Hogwarts grounds from intruders, or chopping down pine trees to decorate the Great Hall for Christmas dinner. But the part Hagrid loved the most was tending to the magical beasts that Hogwarts raised. First Wizarding War The years passed faster, and by the 1970s, Rubius Hagrid found himself quickly becoming a senior member of the staff at Hogwarts. But that wasn't what he remembered most about those years. The 1970s was the start of Lord Voldemort's first campaign against the Ministry, a conflict known as the First Wizarding War. For the next 10 years, Hagrid faithfully served Albus Dumbledore and the Order of the Phoenix as they fought against Voldemort and his Death Eaters. During this time, Hagrid's loyalty, bravery, and unwavering determination shone through like a Lumo spell in the darkest of nights. Alongside Dumbledore and other members, Hagrid clandestinely worked to thwart Voldemort's plans and protect the innocent. Whether it was gathering valuable information or aiding in covert operations, Hagrid played a vital role in the resistance against the Dark Lord's rise to power. When the Dark Wizard finally fell in his failed assassination of Harry Potter, Hagrid was dispatched to retrieve the infant and return him to safety. Hagrid, under orders from Dumbledore himself, flew to the ruined cottage in Godric's Hollow to retrieve baby Harry. Carrying him in his massive arms, Hagrid placed the boy who lived with his muggle relatives, the Dursleys, providing him with a chance to grow up away from the spotlight of his fame. No, sir. House was almost destroyed, but I got him out all right before the muggles started swarming around. He fell asleep as we were flying over Bristol. Acromantula injury Between that fateful night and the next time Hagrid would see Harry Potter, very little changed in the half-giant's life. He continued to work as the gamekeeper at Hogwarts, tending to the aging castle and the creatures who lived there. At one point, while wandering around the Forbidden Forest, Hagrid's love of the tarantula-like Acromantula nearly cost him his life. One of the creatures bit Hagrid and injected enough venom to overwhelm his enhanced immune system. After a short stay in hospital, Hagrid was back on his feet and returned to the Forbidden Forest to spend time with those creatures once more. Reconnecting with Harry In 1991, Hagrid ventured through England to find Harry Potter's last known location. At that time, his adoptive parents, the Dursleys, refused to send the boy to Hogwarts. Hoping to find a secluded home where not even Albus Dumbledore could find them, Potter and the Dursleys ended up on a tiny island, appropriately named Hut on the Rock. It wasn't long before Hagrid tracked Harry down, though, and after a brief shouting match with Harry's uncle, the half-giant took Potter on his very first adventure in the wizarding world. Acting as Harry's guide, Hagrid introduced Harry to the enchanting world of wizards while escorting him through the bustling streets of Diagon Alley and the legendary Leaky Cauldron. In Diagon Alley, a place brimming with wonders, Hagrid ensured that Harry acquired all the necessities for his education. The first stop was Gringotts Wizarding Bank. There, they delved into the depths of the Potter's Vault, retrieving much-needed funds to support Harry's journey through Hogwarts. And what's a birthday without a thoughtful gift? Hagrid surprised Harry with Hedwig, a magnificent snowy white owl who would become Harry's loyal companion throughout his magical endeavors. He also reassured Harry, comforting him about his imminent attendance at Hogwarts. With a gentle smile, he handed Harry a ticket, meticulously detailing the date, time, and place where Harry would board the legendary Hogwarts Express. It was a ticket to not only a magical train, but a ticket to a lifetime of wondrous experiences and unforgettable friendships. Just like many male role models in Harry's life, Hagrid quickly became one of the boy's most important father figures. Especially in Harry's early years, when he suffered as an outcast, Hagrid was always around to lend an ear. Azkaban But after Harry returned to the wizarding world, so did another force, Lord Voldemort, and he was desperate to take on true physical form, at first, he attempted to steal the Philosopher's Stone. At one point, his accomplice in the pursuit, Professor Quirrell, managed to dupe Hagrid into revealing how to get around Hogwarts' newest security measure, a three-headed dog. 
The very next year, Hagrid got in more trouble when messages appeared on Hogwarts wall claiming that the Chamber of Secrets was once again opened. With the original reason for Hagrid's expulsion fresh on everyone's mind, the Ministry quickly determined Hagrid was the villain behind everything and sent him to Azkaban to rot away. After Harry Potter discovered the truth and destroyed both the Basilisk and the Diary of Tom Riddle, the Ministry allowed Hagrid to return. A Professor As the years between the Battle of Hogwarts grew shorter and shorter, Harry Potter's list of mentors and allies grew longer and longer. Once, Hagrid was perhaps the most important figure in the young wizard's life, but that would all change. Although, not all change was bad for Hagrid. By Harry's third year, Hagrid became a professor, taking on teaching responsibilities for the care of magical creatures. The title of professor at Hogwarts was quite an impressive feat. Compared to Hagrid's own classmates, who had actually graduated from Hogwarts, the half-giant actually ended up as one of the most accomplished. The next year, when the Triwizard Tournament concluded and Voldemort took on a new body, Hagrid was assigned a particularly tough task by the Order of the Phoenix. Fearing that the giants might once again align themselves with Voldemort and the Dark Wizards, Hagrid went to their secret colonies to bring them to his side. The mission seemed like it might actually succeed, but on one of the very first nights at the colony, a giant aligned with Dark Wizards killed the ruling chieftain and turned the tribe away from Hagrid and Dumbledore's alliance. Hagrid's time with the giants wasn't an entire failure, though, as he discovered one of his few living relatives, a brother named Grawp. Hagrid returned to Hogwarts, keeping his brother's existence a secret in the Forbidden Forest, but his time there was short-lived. When Dolores Umbridge took over Albus Dumbledore's position, Hagrid was forced out. His exile didn't last long, though, as Dumbledore eventually returned. But the months that followed continued with conflict after conflict. It all culminated with the Battle of the Astronomy Tower, where Severus Snape killed Albus Dumbledore. Through a torrent of tears, Hagrid carried the old wizard's body at his funeral, laying him to rest as the latest victim of Voldemort's new war. Hagrid would be placed in a similarly grim scenario the following year, when Harry Potter fought against Voldemort and nearly died. While Harry was in limbo, Hagrid carried the lifeless corpse just as he had done for Dumbledore. This time, though, Potter managed to come back to life and finished the fight against Voldemort, striking him dead during the Battle of Hogwarts. Which brings me to my next point. What happened to Hagrid after Voldemort's fall? After the Deathly Hallows At the end of the Battle of Hogwarts, many lives were lost, and apart from the brief epilogue when the last book slash film ended, we weren't given much more info with regards to what exactly happened to most of the surviving characters. We see Harry, Ginny, Hermione, Ron, Malfoy, and more sending their children off to Hogwarts at Platform 9 and 3 quarters, but Hagrid is nowhere to be seen. So what came of the gentle giant? Where did Hagrid go when the chaos ended and all of the dust settled? As much as I love Sirius Black, Hagrid was, in my eyes, Harry's true father figure. He was there for him right from the beginning of his life, and carefully watched over him as he grew from a young boy to a young man. Hagrid was the one who introduced Harry to the wizarding world. He showed him the ropes, and he even bought Harry Hedwig. He's also the one that grabbed Harry from the Potter residence and brought him to Privet Drive, and teary-eyed as he left Harry on the Dursley's doorstep. With no close family relationships in his life, a father that died and a mother that left, Harry was all Hagrid had, and Hagrid's care for Harry was shown in his actions and behavior throughout the series. After the Wizarding War ended, many people were left uncertain of their next course of action, as many of the people that they knew and loved had died. Though the good guys emerged victorious, Hogwarts was in shambles, and many relationships had been severed. Hagrid's closest relationships were with Harry, Dumbledore, and the school, and both the school, at least temporarily, and Dumbledore were down for the count. So what did Hagrid do next? Well, it turns out that Hagrid simply continued working at Hogwarts in his usual posting. The only thing that Hagrid loved more than Hogwarts was his love of magical creatures, which explains why he would choose to continue on as a professor for the care of magical creatures at the school. Hagrid is also referenced in the epilogue by Harry while speaking to his son, Albus. Bye, Al, said Harry as his son hugged him. Don't forget Hagrid's invited you to tea next Friday. 
Don't mess with peeves. Don't duel anyone till you've learned how. And don't let James wind you up. The epilogue of Harry Potter gave us a glimpse of 19 years into the future, which would make the year 2017, and Hagrid 89 years old. However, thanks to the longevity of wizard kind, I'm sure that Hagrid was still very sprightly. In addition to teaching at Hogwarts, it's been suggested that Hagrid may have, at one point, further pursued a relationship with Madame Maxime. However, the two eventually proved to be too different to make things work. We don't have much more info on the gentle half-giant other than this, but I hope this gives you some closure with regards to Hagrid's character. And that's it for this video. Did you know much about Hagrid's life? His beginnings? What video do you want next? Be sure to leave a comment down below. Until next time, remember, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live.